how life may exist beyond death. The idea that there is life after death may seem like something we can never hope to prove or disprove. But in actual fact, we probably could, if only we knew what life and death were. Scientists have trouble defining what it means for something to live. And if you don't know what life is, how can you possibly determine when it ends? This question goes beyond the finite lifespans of single organisms too. For how can you judge a form of life to have died if its descendants are still alive today? Are life and death outdated concepts, or will they become so one day? And if so, what would it mean to continue living beyond your biological expiry? How could life exist beyond death? Number 3. The Death of a Species the definition of the death of a species is the moment when a group of living organisms cease to exist. However, if that particular organism morphs, spreads, or leaves something else behind, could it truly be said to have died? Many species don't die out. They evolve into something else. Modern birds are considered to be theropod dinosaurs which evolved during the Mesozoic era. This means that some dinosaurs never went extinct they merely changed into something else. So if we accept that to be true, then should we allow ourselves to mentally reverse the process and say that nothing can go extinct if its ancestors remain alive too? Why must the continuation of a life form be so linear? If you consider the tree of life as containing branches which double back on each other instead of splitting off in one direction, I guess it wouldn't look much like a tree anymore. But under this system, an organism can be said to live for as long as its relatives do. Based on our current definition of life, all living things on Earth can trace their biological lineage back to the same organisms. So if we threw out microbes to a far-flung world and they outlasted mankind, would there be a case for saying that they are our ancestors? If I sneeze on Jupiter and my snot becomes a race of beings, aren't they my babies? They may start out primitive, and they may be biologically separated from what you would scientifically identify as human beings. But does this matter? We all come from the same organisms. We all have the same origin stories. This ties into the hypothesis of directed panspermia, which suggests life on Earth could have been seeded here by an ancient race. If so, are we their live descendants even if we're not biologically related? Why should reproduction and evolution be the only ways of continuing a life form? Number 2. Body and Mind The waters become muddled ever further when we bring technology into the equation of life and death. Some predict the next evolutionary stage of man will be our melding with machines. Once this happens, and non-biological components gradually account for more of our bodies, could we reach a stage where a fully artificial entity is considered to have direct lineage from biological man. And if so, does this mean that humans would be able to cheat death since machines cannot die? This forthcoming scenario poses us with a question. If entities created in the womb are said to be an extension of our life forms, why not the creations of our mind? At present, human consciousness seems fully intertwined with our physical bodies. If you try to separate them, and I wouldn't advise this, both parts die. But if, one day, we develop the ability to transport consciousness, will we have to redefine what life and death mean? For example, if your body died and you were able to store your mind in another vessel, you could be said to be still alive by virtue of your mind's continued existence. Yet, in reverse, the parameters become less clear. If you put someone else's mind in your body, then most would consider you dead. But what if you made a copy of your mind and you placed it back into your original body after the previous mind died? Is this the start of a new life or the continuation of the old one? And if a version of your mind remains alive somewhere, albeit as a copy, does this count as life beyond death? 
I don't want to be considered alive if my mind is left on an old hard drive in my grandson's attic. That is no way to live, at all. We can identify and explain what a biological body is, but we can't say the same for consciousness. Recent observations of the brains of hospital patients who had biologically died showed signs of conscious thought continuing. The scientific definition of life, death, and consciousness is not complete. It may never be. They will be improved upon, though. And when this happens, we may be able to answer some profound questions. The most important query regarding life would be the origin of consciousness. Can consciousness create itself from organic cells? Or does it arrive in our brains from an external source? If it's the latter, then why must it die with our bodies? Can consciousness only exist in tandem with a physical entity? Or can it sustain itself and remain aware outside of it? If so, then we have no definition for either life or death meaning that neither may exist as we know it. Much research has been done on the topic of consciousness through the field of biocentrism, which says that death is probably not real, or at the very least, it is not as permanent as we define it. Consciousness, and therefore life, might move across realities via the multiverse to continue living. Dr. Robert Lanza, a biocentrism proponent, thinks that when this happens, Time reboots for that particular life form, and it lives on in an alternative point in space-time. When your biological presence fades, the energy of consciousness funnels away on the quantum level to another world, with death described as being a reboot that leads to all potentialities, including one reality where you are a video game character. Number 1. The Virtual World if life and death are not what we think, then perhaps reality isn't all it seems either. The simulation hypothesis tells us that human beings might exist inside a virtual world that has been constructed by another being. In this instance, death would be of the virtual self, nothing more. Your presence in this reality consists of an avatar that is separate to you, whatever you are. It can be killed. It can live forever. It is not your true form any more than you are Trevor Phillips when you're bashing that hooker's head in GTA 5. The idea of living in a virtual world before passing to a real world is not too dissimilar to the religious concept of an afterlife. Both say this existence is temporary and that it's ruled over by its creator. And it is also assumed that you are being judged based on your actions. When you leave, what happens next is determined by what kind of life you've led. Admittedly, in one of these scenarios, if you sin, you burn forever in fiery pits of excrement. Mess up in the virtual world, and your only punishment might be failing to get on the high-score leaderboard. Because life and death, for all we know, could be nothing more than a game. If our world is virtual, there's nothing stopping this from being a possibility. If so, what is the end? What is the point? What is true reality really like? What is the true purpose of real life and real death? And is there any coming back from it? We're going to explore the idea of life and death a little further in our bonus video, The Search for Immortality, which you can watch on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash strange mysteries. For a $2 a month pledge, which you can cancel at any time, you'll get to watch this and all of our bonus content, which goes deeper and darker into every topic than YouTube allows. If you don't want to donate, then that bull We know you wanted more. Strange mysteries on YouTube and our Patreon bonus videos weren't enough to quench your search for truth, to give you that sense of awe and wonder again, to go past what you thought was the end, to give you the answers you seek, but which only lead to more questions. That's why we just up the stakes. Chemicals of reality. Reality, consciousness, brains. What else is there? Ask yourself that question. Perhaps that's all there really is, but perhaps everything else is found within a place where these ideas, these things, overlap. Some thing, some place that is undefinable. To many people, altering certain chemicals in their brains produces what they would simply call hallucinations. In fact, what we're going to discuss specifically used to be called the businessman's trip, 
as one could enjoy it. Come down and put your pants back on in the time it takes to eat lunch. It wasn't taken seriously. Well, unless, of course, you started digging. And some people, including us, did. Already, though, to many people, this chemical is special amongst others. Very special. To them, it represents something more meaningful and incredible, as if it's the gateway to the next level of consciousness. The ticket to a higher reality barely explored by most humans. It is the entry point to a new reality, visited by only a select few whose minds have become enlightened through the use of this exotic substance. For this reason, it's commonly referred to as the spirit molecule. But is its reputation as a mystical mind opener deserved? Or is it and everything it represents just a load of bullshit? We look at, investigate, and dive deeply into nearly all available research regarding this question from nearly every angle feasible. And in the course of doing so, stumble upon unexplainable patterns, correlations, and neurological evidence for a reality existing beyond this one. Watch this hour-long Strange Mysteries premium video, Chemicals of Reality, as well as many more to come by becoming an elite premium member of our Patreon at patreon.com slash strange mysteries.